Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to a brand new episode of Kaiju Conversation, the podcast where we talk a little bit of kaiju and mostly tokusatsu. False advertising, I know. But joining me today, you're uh, uh, today me. I'm Elijah E. T. However you want to call me. Joining me today is the reoccurring guest, the editor of the podcast, the one and only Rex. How are you today, Rex? Hello, I am doing good today. That's good to hear. Very, very pleased to hear that. So, what what's new since two weeks ago when you were on? Uh, well, we watched Super Inframan, a little movie. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Yes, and, and unless you actually didn't read the title of this episode and you just saw we uploaded a new episode and you're like, I gotta listen to these guys because some for some reason I like Elijah's voice, which if you do, good for you. And I'm just here by unpopular demand. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my other three ideas just kind of cancelled. So, nice. so we had to go with the fourth idea. And I'm not actually upset. I, I think this is a good good way to start tokusatsu from Asian territories off um, for the podcast. Ironically, reboot. not from Japan. Right, right. And I guess that kind of goes back to what we were saying about like enjoying all of Tokusatsu, you know, there's more than mm. Ultraman, Common Rider, and Godzilla. So it's it's good to start with something like this. But there is a lot of Ultraman and Common Rider. Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more than a little bit. <laughs> so yeah, we're we're watching the nineteen seventy five Shaw Brothers film, The Super Inframan. AKA Chinese Superman. Yeah, Chinese Superman. So, funny enough, this was bef- it came out before Superman's movie. So, hmm. so, they weren't really trying to bank on uh the 70s Superman movie. So, maybe this is where they hmm. got inspiration to do Superman. I'm joking, but that would actually be kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't say that there isn't a superhero movie that that was inspired by uh, Inframan, because there may have been one. There was a few, but they weren't movies. Oh no, I'm referring to a pretty high-profile movie from a few years ago. Pretty high-profile movie from a few years ago. I feel like I'm, I'm missing the joke here. Oh, there's no joke. <laughs> oh, wait, what was the, what was it? Uh, apparently, apparently, Ant Man actually took some inspiration in because uh, uh, the MCU Ant Man movie took its inspiration in designs from uh, for Ant Man and the Yellow Jacket from some Tokusatsu like Ultraman Correct. and Inframan. Common writer. Wait, really? Yeah. I, I I knew Ultraman, and then I knew Common Rider because Common Rider it's a bug, you know. But really, yeah. From what I've read, Inframan was one of the inspirations that Peyton. I forgot his last name. I think Peyton it's Reed. Reed. Yeah, yeah. That Peyton Reed apparently he took inspiration from this movie. For An interesting time. thing here um, at the end, because I listen to all the commentaries because I'm a weirdo. At the <laughs> end of the commentary track. Or Ant Man and the Wasp, he said the you know that the end credits where it's got kinda like got the clay models? Yeah. Um he said in the commentary that he was trying to replicate a Godzilla Gamera film. So oh. what I'm taking this is is Peyton Reed along with um James Gunn, who has been very vocal that he likes Common Rider like a lot. Um hmm. I, I think we're we're going to start looping kind of the the tokusatsu fans that are doing Marvel movies right now, and so far I think it's only James Gunn and Peyton Reed, because 
I don't think anybody else has expressed interest. Maybe Scott Derrickson, but I could be wrong there. Who knows? Maybe someone's just maybe someone's just hiding their love of Tokusatsu. It seemed like like I, I don't know. It just seems like a lot of people do. Hmm. And then, like the one time they talk about it, they're like, "Yeah, I grew up on this movie. It was called like Gargantuas or something. Yeah, and I loved it because it was the good Gargantua against the bad Gargantua, hmm. you know. And then everybody talks about that one sentence, and they never talk <laughs> about that movie ever again. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but it, it's very interesting. I actually didn't know that that Peyton Reed took inspiration from Inframan. Hmm. Yeah, no, I find it it makes sense to me, looking at mm -hmm. uh, the Ant Man design and uh, the MCU. It's something that I didn't figure oh, out yeah. until I heard it, and I was like, that just clicks. Mm -hmm. And actually, speaking of, uh, since we're talking about Tokusatsu and Marvel, isn't there a common writer inspired Spider Man suit? Yeah, the there PS5 is. Remastered. Yeah, the uh, I yeah. think it was called like the Arachnid Rider. Yeah, I'm personally yeah. not a uh, Spider-Man fan, but I'm not going to deny that act that it actually does look pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the documentary series on Disney Plus six one six. Their I think it was the premiere episode was Supata Man. Yeah, it's the first one, and I love that. I I've been meaning to watch that. I, I have too. I need to get Disney Plus for it. I have Disney Plus, so I just need to find the time to watch it, really. Can you send me your password and email? No. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, but no. But it it's awesome to see, at least for it, I, and I'm probably wrong here, so if you're a DC fan, please send me a message on Discord or Twitter or something, and tell me all the stuff that DC's been inspired from. But I love seeing Marvel is like they're they're being a little obvious now that Tokusatsu is very inspirational to them, hmm. and that's just kind of nice to see. I mean, they they literally have an Ultraman comic series going on, and they had Godzilla. Yeah, they had Godzilla at a time. This is very off the off very the, off the topic of track Inframan. <laughs> yeah, which doesn't actually impact our, our kind of thoughts on the movie. I promised. Uh, I got. I guess let's go ahead and start with our initial thoughts. Um, Rex, right. if you want to start us off there. Uh, well, having having seen Inframan, my thoughts are more or less a very simple this is very a very wacky movie a very crazy movie but i love it for that mm -hmm. yeah this the film is definitely just out of this world bonkers hmm. um it's got crazy stunt it's hmm. it's got a weird ending that's very abrupt Hmm. Um, the editing is so weird. Yeah, I was, everything I was going to say that I found the editing was really uh, weird and jarring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, everything about the film, it's just so absurd. Hmm. And especially the dub. The dub is um, so insanely over-the-top and funny. The dub is great. Oh my god. The dub makes the film even more crazy. Yeah. This uh, this is definitely one of those movies where I think I prefer the dub to watch, sort of like Godzilla Final Wars, because it's a crazy movie that the dub just makes, and the dub just makes it so much, so much more entertaining. It really complements how whack everything is. Mm-hmm. And I do find it interesting because I that I think that's kind of all we wanted to say opinion wise because I think everything that needs to be said about this film has been said. I, I think we're really now going to go into the 
the factoids, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny that this is so crazy because this was actually China's first superhero movie mm. and one of their only ones, actually. Um, the uh, source I was reading credited this as the first science fiction movie by China or Hong Kong. I think it might have been. I know China, at least recently, has been doing more like Sentai shows, hmm. but it's uh, it's only like four of them. Hmm. But it's this is kind of crazy as their hmm. really debut f- film into this genre. Hmm. But I I kind of it feels almost what's what's the term I'm looking for here. It feels kind of nice to know that their debut was as inspired as it was by Kamen Rider and Ultraman. It's kind of nice to see that from a Chinese studio. Hmm. Yeah. uh, Where do we begin on uh, production? Do you want to start or do I start? I mean, you can go ahead and start that. I from all I researched, I really noticed. Uh, I guess I'm starting off here. <laughs> uh, Continue. I found it very interesting, like the communication between um, Michio Makami. I'm probably butchering that name. Mm. Uh, the guy that made the suits. Yeah. And he actually was the guy that made all the suits for Common Rider. Um, and worked on Inazuman and Kikaida, uh, Kikaida 0 1, I believe, Kamen Rider V3, and a lot of other tokusatsu. Apparently, um, he worked on, uh, as a model, he worked on potentially uh, Godzilla 1954, Rodan, yes. Nezera, and uh, the original Gamera. And the Mysterians. He also worked on the uh, other Gamera films. Mm. He was he worked with Tsuburaya and the Yagi brothers a lot. Mm. So it he he was very well acquainted with the genre of tokusatsu and yeah. suit making. Mm. And I think it kind of shows like the suits in this look pretty good compared to Kakaida that I'm currently watching. No, the suits are they they were more or less on par with uh, the early sh- Ultra and Rider shows of the time, honestly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would even argue they're a little bit better. Um, uh, this film, I think it came out after he had worked on uh, Kamen Rider V3, and that mm-hmm. was really where he started to really polish his handiwork. Mm-hmm. And it just... You you can kind of tell. It it feels very much a polished Showa era suit yeah. for a film like this. It's a Showa era Tokusatsu for all that for all the good that entails, pretty much. Wholeheartedly agree. It's hmm. it's it's got everything it needs to be absurdly Showa era. Hmm. And that's not a bad thing whatsoever. Not even close to a bad thing. So uh, I might, talking about the suits, uh, I guess I'll just talk about some things uh, from my research. So uh, design-wise, Inframan, as well as most, if not all the monsters, don't ask me what I was saying there, uh, were (laughs) by the art director of this film was Johnson Sao Chuang... Sheng, I butchered that name horribly. I apologize to anyone who can actually pronounce that name. I apologize to anybody that even knows what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, uh, they had designed about 20, mon- 20 different monsters, 20 different unique monsters for the film, but uh, most of which were scrapped. Uh, some of the scrap designs were based on snakes, lizards, scorpions, snails, and squirrels, apparently. And, uh... And that's, that's actually an interesting thing, because at this time, 
and uh, it doesn't it makes clear sense because of the writer influence but early toei um henshin so i'm going to loop in azuman uh kikaida and common rider i've only seen kikaida and common or i've seen clips of common rider and i've watched a bit of kikaida but all of their blends are really based on animals so it's kind yeah. of interesting that these scrap designs were animal based because that's what Toei was doing just a few years prior. So you can really see the influence there with uh, Super. From the writer shows I've seen, usually they sort of have a they have a general theme, and then the designs of the monsters usually follow a motif relevant to. Uh, whatever the mm -hmm. is. Yeah, because if I remember correctly, and Travis from Kaiju Weekly can correct me all he wants here, he is my go-to common Rider guy currently. From what I know, the first common Rider is about them taking down an evil corporation that is harming the environment, and common Rider has to go and stop them and fight evil animals or something like that. I could be wrong there. I've seen about two episodes of the original Kamen Rider, and I can... I vaguely... I, I remember the organization was called Shocker, and that they kept, they were the ones who actually turned... Uh, uh, I think his name was Takeshi Hongo to uh, becoming the original Kamen Rider. Mm -hmm. But yeah. From what I can tell the uh, costumes for this movie were actually provided by a studio call, uh, called Ekisu Productions. I'm probably butchering that name too. Yes, that also known as X Productions in America. Ah, but yeah, they worked on some of Toei's Toku shows before, so it makes complete sense that it would be more or less the same quality. And they worked on Yongari, Monster from the Deep. Huh. Yongari is credited as um, the South Korean company slash Toei because hmm. the people that did the suit were working with Toei at the time. Hmm. But yeah, um, there, there were about eight different uh, monster suits that were used in production. There's an interview where the director claims there, are tr there were actually 12 unique suits, but I don't know, mate. I, I can't tell if that's like missed memory or if that's just something that, uh, well, I don't know what I'm trying to say. But yeah, point I is. I mean, they could have been cut because, yeah. like, they cut out yeah. um, one is, a special bike. One, uh, one of the monsters of the eight that I know exists for a fact was actually cut from the film, which was mm -hmm. a chameleon monster. Ooh, that sounds cool. Yeah, because it it actually had a suit and scenes were filmed with it. Mm -hmm. Do you know if there's any stills of that around? Or... Uh, yeah, there are, actually. I actually saw one during my research. Because <laughs> I know they also were going to have Inframan riding a stylized bike, like Kamen Rider in, in his uh, Kikaida. Yeah, I, I was going to actually discuss that, actually, what the, uh, what the bike was uh, going to be like originally. I, it sounds like a lot of things got cut from this film. Yeah, from, <laughs> from, what, I, from what I've gathered, uh, a lot of the abilities of like the monsters and Inframan himself were constantly changing during production. Like This movie was actually marketed with abilities that were presumably in older scripts or drafts of the script that ended up being changed and said abilities got cut out of the film. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Do you mm -hmm. think that in this, uh, I don't know if you know the answer, but just kind of your thoughts here. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was because of production issue, like the budgetary reasons, or do you think they just, didn't know what they were doing because this was a first time thing and it was constantly changing for good and bad. I think it 
could be a mix of both. And uh, just to sort of give a thing for why I think at least at least uh, production issues with it and then sort of not just not being able to do it uh, would be going back to the motorcycle. Originally, it was going to have like a machine gun attached to the front and was supposed to also have, quote, rocket firing capabilities, quote, on the sides. And apparently it wasn't working well on camera for whatever reason, so they discarded those uh, accessories. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. See, I would have loved to have seen all of this in the final version. Yeah. Uh, apparently, that apparently um, for product, uh, sorry, for promotion for the film, uh, sh the Shaw brothers have like had their own uh, movie publication magazine where they would print, they would print comic strips uh, of like early earlier scripts of uh, some of their movies. Inframan actually got this treatment with with the art being done by. Lin Mao Long, who actually did uh, concept design for the actual film, and the strip basically it well first off it featured monsters that weren't actually in the film, and had some scenes that were also very different. It was also a bit more gruesome, like uh, you know the spider monster that is in the movie. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, that was going to act in the. In this uh, comic strip, it uses acid to dissolve one of the researcher's hands. See, it, while watching this movie the first time, mm -hmm. um, I was very tired. And I, when I watched it, I watched it, and then the day after, I watched Kaida. Mm -hmm. And going to be honest here, upon re-watching it for this podcast, mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out, okay, which was Kikaida and which was Super Inframan, because both shows are very similar. And when I say very similar, I mean like almost, it seems like they're almost identical from the few episodes I've watched, or maybe it's just because I was tired when watching both. Mm. Um, because there was a bug monster in Kikaida that spit acid and oh. was a bug. And hmm. it's just, it's kind of funny to see the parallels that hmm. Inframan has with all of these other tokusatsu shows. Hmm. Oh, and one more thing, uh, the chameleon monster also uh, appeared in the comic strip and fought huh. Lehman in his human form, which is interesting. Now, what other creatures were in that comic strip? Do you know or those uh, just the two that you could find? I know there was like a tree monster that, a giant tree that may or may not be the plant monster from the film. The mm -hmm. the source of that didn't was kind of seemed to be unsure of that it uh, themselves. So maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Mm -hmm. Of course. I, okay, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like this film is a compilation film almost because of how many monsters and just kind of all the action that really the plot barely holds together? Do you kind of feel like it's a compilation film? I didn't think of that, but it act that actually does make a lot more a lot of sense. To my knowledge, it's not, but it just feels like what a compilation film would be. I actually agree with that. It does feel like one, but even though really mm -hmm. in one. Mm -hmm. I, Cause like you have, isn't it? So you've got the bug, the tree, the drill guy. Um, you've got the actual palace. And all of those monsters. Am I forgetting any? Or is it just those four? Seven main monsters in the uh, film. Seven main monsters. Yeah. See, it feels like th that was like seven separate episodes. Yeah. And like, they're all just thrown in there. And somehow it works with the plot. Yeah. You don't ask questions. Yeah. 
but it, it's it's very interesting how I feel like this movie wouldn't work with today's standards because I don't think the plot would be able to hold itself. But I, I think the plot is like holding itself right now. Hmm. It's definitely a movie that wouldn't be made today. But speaking of compilation, this actually featured music from Ultra 7 and, and Mirror Man. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Did, did you know that before you went in to watch it? Uh, I knew that when because it was mentioned during uh, my research. Mm -hmm. I didn't specifically hear any tracks that I recognized from Ultra 7. And really? I, I, I don't know the Mirror Man uh, soundtrack. Because yeah. whenever I watch this, I'm 90% sure I'd already heard the, the, that bit of info before, but mm -hmm. I forgot. And when I watched it, I, I heard the, the jingle, and it's, it's at the very beginning whenever the city gets destroyed. Um, right after, there's a musical cue, and I'm like, wait, that's from an Ultraman show. Huh. And then I'm like, oh, it's Ultra 7. So I caught on to it really quick. I'm going to need to keep that in mind for whenever the next time I watch this movie is now. Now... We we kind of touched on this, but the film came out August first, nineteen seventy five. Yeah. So it is forty five years old hmm. at this point. Hmm. Do you think it holds up? Uh, like in what way does it hold up? Any way you want to, like whether it's how like if it feels like it's like the special effects or the storytelling is there any part of this that holds up or do you think it is very much a mid-70s tokusatsu hmm. product i'd say it's it's definitely a mid-70s uh tokusatsu product but i don't see that as a bad thing right I think what I, I one thing I think we're both trying to really get across here is yes, this movie's absurdly crazy, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Hmm. But that's not a bad thing. It's not awful. It's fun. Pretty much. Now, one thing that I want you to keep in mind: this was the first movie the Shaw Brothers actually storyboarded. Really. Yes, this, this was the only time that they had actually planned out their scenes before filming. Huh. And this is the product we got. Hmm. It is crazy. Hmm. I, don't, there, I don't see how... I would be scared to see what they had done with storyboards <laughs> at this point. <laughs> and another interesting thing here... Hmm. This film was actually marketed at a Chinese film festival as Chinese Ultraman. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh. Interesting that, you know, it it really didn't market itself as those, except for this one film festival, which I find interesting because at this time we kind of been very it was kind of normal for things to market itself like that. I mean, um, if, I don't know if you've, if your source, whatever if your sources you were reading from uh, mentioned this, but they, uh, they had their uh, way with marketing this movie, especially in Hong Kong and China. Uh, like, obviously they just, they'd had, they'd like, they had the magazine with the uh, comic strip. They had articles, publicity things. But uh, about a month before the uh, movie premiered, in, on Jul actually, no, a couple of weeks before the movie premiered, on July 20th, uh, 
at Victoria Park, they did a publicity stunt with two hot air balloons and uh, <laughs> Danny Lee, the uh, main actor, wore, was wearing the Inframan costume while taking to the air in one of those balloons. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, um, uh, I... Kids, so. I was reading August Raguni's little thing, and they mentioned the hot air balloons. Yeah, I love this marketing. Hmm. I find the weird sort of uh, the weird marketing stunts of some Tokusatsu movies really interesting. Like, there's this one for Gamma vs. Gauss, where apparently they had Gauss holding. Uh, a press conference, supposedly. I think that's hilarious. There is nothing like Asian marketing. It <laughs> is amazing in every sort of way. I love it. <laughs> Speaking of marketing, hmm. uh, in Germany and Turkey, hmm. The marketing for this film said it was based on a Jules Verne novel. Really? Yes. Um, that was one of the things. Is it was like adapted from one of the most exciting Jules Verne novels. I'm wondering if they did that because at this time Jules Verne movies were still pretty popular in the late 60s, kind of 70s era. But mm. it's very weird that they did hmm. that. Hmm. It's actually quite quite interesting. Now, both of us really said that this film was crazy, hmm. but did you check out any of the reviews for this film? Because I, I read a few. I, I've i read uh, Roger Ebert's review, which I know you've also read, <laughs> and uh, I saw a little bit of I saw a couple snippet of quotes from a couple other reviews. Now, is it just me, or did the film actually... It's got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, fun fact. Really? Even though that doesn't mean it's, like, I, I, I highly acclaimed. It just, yeah. But, yeah, it's got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. I, I guess Roger Ebert gave it two and a half initially, and then he gave it three yeah. stars... Um, when he saw Mighty Peking Man. Yeah. But it's so weird. This film has a higher rating than some of the Showa era Godzilla movies. So clearly they did something right. It, honestly, it has a higher rating than most of the Godzilla movies that uh, Ebert reviewed, which, to be fair, that's not too many, but. I mean, compared to 80, 85, for example, uh, he liked this movie a lot more. His rating is so weird. I, I, yeah. I don't understand it. Because mm. didn't he give Gamma Guardian of the Universe a lower rating, too? Uh, no, he gave Gamma Guardian of the Universe a positive review. It was actually a... Uh, Gene Siskel, who didn't like Gamma Guardian of the Universe, if I'm not mistaken. But it, it's just so weird, because you would have thought that critics would have panned Inframan. But... Yeah. The only explanation I can give is they also gave Megalon, uh, Godzilla mm. vs. Megalon, a lot of... That got a lot of positive ratings, but it was because the people reviewing it knew it was supposed to be absurd. So, mm. upon its review, it received mm. a lot of positivity. So, maybe mm. Inframan just looked out with something like that. That wouldn't shock me, honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've probably seen that one review that says that uh, Godzilla 1985 was too straight to be funny. From a guy that uh, gave Godzilla's Revenge a rather positive review. Viewers are weird. Yeah. Opinions <laughs> are weird. Actually, an interesting thing about uh, this movie's uh, US release was that it was actually, in when it released uh, domestically, it underperformed to the expectations. 
and barely made its money back domestically. But when it released in the US, it got picked up by a man named Joseph Brenner. Uh, it was a surprising success at the box office and to the point where rumor has it that uh, the film's success in America led uh, producer Run Run Shaw, who was the founder of uh, Shaw Brothers Studios, to begin planning an infra-woman movie that would have been shot uh, in the summer of 1990, uh, 1977. Mm -hmm. I know they wanted to do a sequel, but hmm. due to its underperformance, they scrapped everything for a sequel. Hmm. But I think it was my re I was I think I was reading Kevin Derendorf's Kaiju for Hipsters book, and I think he was the one, or might have been John LeMay. They both, mm -hmm. uh, one of them mentioned that had a sequel happened, it probably wouldn't have lived up to the wonderful craziness that was the first one. And mm -hmm. it might have eventually ruined it as a cult movie that now mm -hmm. has a pretty good following from a lot of people. Yeah. But speaking of its U.S. release, did you know there's actually two versions of this film? Really? Yes. So we've got the original version, which is what's available, but on a Good Times Entertainment VHS. They released the film, but they wanted it to adhere to a wider audience because the Super Inframan basically gave people the idea, oh, this is just a superhero movie. That's it. But... Mm. I guess Good Times thought, well, why don't we change the film a bit? So they actually took the film before they released it, and they pasted it in between the title and the cast and the crew a additional scene where it was short snippets from the film, and it was basically made to introduce you to all the monsters. And huh. it was given the subtitle Battles of the Sci-Fi Monsters. Mm. So I, I read a little bit about it, but it but my source the source I was reading didn't really get too much into it. Mm -hmm. And I guess outside of the good times Home Entertainment release, it was never released again. One thing I kind of am a little sad about is, at least in America, Super Inframan got a release in 2006, which I was able to find for a good price um, about hmm. three weeks ago. But outside of that, hmm. it's not been released here in the States again. This is a perfect title hmm. for Arrow, just saying. Arrow, yeah. this is a perfect title for you. Actually, funny thing, uh, while I was researching, I actually saw someone who had a mock-up that someone had done for, like, an Arrow video cover uh, for a release <laughs> of this movie. I mean, it, it would go, it would fit right up their alley. It's crazy. It's a cult movie. It's, it's everything it Absolutely. needs to be. Absolutely. But it's a nice movie. I wish we could see more of it just because of how absurd it is. <laughs> but I, I really hope we get to see a lot of the Shaw Brothers films, especially their tokusatsu kind of inspired films hmm. like Mighty Peking Man. I really hope we get to see those come back on Blu-ray. Yeah. Speaking of Mighty Peking Man... The main actor for this film, Danny Lee, was yeah. also in Mighty Peking Man. Hmm. Yeah. From what I hear, from what I can tell, he was chosen for this for the role of Layman or the Inframan because of his proficiency in both karate and judo, as well as having uh, skills with riding motorcycles. <laughs> Which, out of curiosity, do you find the fact that this is a kung fu movie? 
annoying when it comes to the fighting and the monster stuff, or do you think it adds something to this film that's special? I just think it's fun, really. Mm-hmm. It, it's a fun movie. I it's it's one I, of those I think if you put on in the background having fun with your friends like a Saturday afternoon, I think it's perfect for that. Maybe. Or a but college party like where everybody's drunk and <laughs> 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 No, that's when you put on final walls. So we've been talking about its production and what inspired it. And we briefly touched on it, but do you know of yeah. any other instance where the Inframan inspired something? I was able to find one other thing, but do you know of any other uh, inspirations? There, there was something else that was mentioned, but I don't think I have it written down, unfortunately. So I was... So I found uh, through some research, and Nathan from Monster and Film Fault will probably be happy with this, but it helped influence the revival in 2017 of Mystery Science Theater 3000. The... Oh, oh, that. Oh, okay, yeah, I read a little bit about that because wasn't uh, one of the characters in that inspired? Fired by Inframan? Yes, um, one of the main villains, she was inspired by Princess Dragon Mom uh, yeah. with her costume. So, hmm. very interesting how this film yeah. was able to inspire the revival. And this is perfect for Mystery Science Theater. Like, this film hmm. would be perfect. Hmm. And then, on yeah. top of that, it inspired Ant-Man, which I was very surprised at. Hmm. Yeah. So I, I since we've kind of touched on uh, some more influences, I, I do think to start to conclude this, I want to bring up something that I find very funny and great. Mm. Mm. This film basically takes parts of three tokusatsu franchises and pastes mm. them in there. You've got the mm. Spasium Ray, the uh, Henshin Kick, and then the Thunder yeah. Punches from, uh, what was the show called? Um, Mason X, I think it's called? I could mm. be wrong. But what did you think, because I know you're an Ultraman fan, what mm. did you think at the f of the fact that the Specium Ray is pretty much just copied and pasted in here? Mm. It's a different color, and uh, yeah, it's called something different. Yeah. Well, I just saw it and thought it was just kind of um, kind of cool. Uh, the producer of this movie was a, he was really fascinated by Ultraman and Kamen Rider and both the production, like the actual production of Tokusatsu, but also the marketing to consumers with things like toys, which is something I find interesting. I think we can both agree that this is basically a fan film. Yeah. Like, everybody involved was a fan of Tokusatsu, Kamen Rider, Ultraman. Oh, yeah. I, I, I see if... I, I personally see more Kamen Rider influences. Like, mm -hmm. not just, like, the motorbike and the fact that he's usually human-sized, but... Things like even like the uh, the grunts that make the weird noises are a lot like uh, the the shocker grunts from the original Carbon Rider. Mm -hmm. the, the noise they make especially sounds very similar. Yeah, I at least because like I said, I haven't watched Common Rider yet, hmm. but I got a lot of Kikaida vibes, hmm. and from what I've gotten, um, the info I've been told, Kikaida is a lot like Common Rider. Hmm. So. So sure I can yeah. definitely uh, see that. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Right? Uh, didn't you say it's the same studio? Uh, same creator, I, I said. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, it is. It's it's it the is same person that designed Common Rider. 
I'm not sure off the top of my head. Yeah, I just searched it up. It is. Mm. Now, one last thing I, I got here mm. to throw out there mm. is this film said we were going to have Inframans by 2015 because this is actually set in the year 2015. Oh, yeah. Where's our Inframan? <laughs> uh, I need our Inframan. Well, who knows what the governments are hiding? If they're hiding Inframan, they just need to have him out here. We need to see yeah. him in all of his bug-eyed glory. Yeah. So, do you have anything else you really want to talk about this movie? The last thing I want to say is just uh, a couple little factoids that I found that I just found kind of interesting. So, uh, specifically, the one that I really want to uh, talk about is in terms of uh, production, uh, in terms of like production stories, uh, there were apparently there were a lot of concerns about the pyrotechnics that were being used for the mm -hmm. film. Yeah, because concerned of wasn't it... their safety. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it like if fire got on the suits, they would burn up? Uh, I don't know, but there actually was one instance of one of the monster suits being caught on fire during a fight scene. I don't know which monster, <laughs> but yeah. And there's also a apparently one of the while filming the final, like the final act. I think it might have been the the escape scene at the very end, but I could be wrong. Uh, there's a large explosion that nearly burnt off one of the actress's face, apparently. Uh, like um, it lawsuits impending? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, if, if that's actually true, then that's one of the craziest tokusatsu uh, behind-the-scenes stories I've heard. Probably not the craziest, but... Um, it's up there. I feel like a lot of stuff about this film is crazy. We just don't <laughs> know it. So, what what other facts do you have for me? Uh, just some other factoids. Um, well, the director of this movie was Hua Shan. He was he joined the Shaw Brothers Studio in 1963 as an assistant director of photography for Holan Ho Lan Shan, who Ho Lan Shan ended up becoming the director of photography for his apprentice's work on this movie. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And uh, a couple other little factoids is that uh, the film went into production late 1974 for about two months and began filming in January of 19. 75 shooting lasted about a hundred days so a little over three months pretty much it wrapped during <laughs> April so this film basically had a production schedule of you said December 74 right uh, it's my source said late 74 Pre-production was for two months, so it probably would have been about November. So, November, so it had ten months to write, hmm. film, edit, special effects, market, hmm. cast, and cut, uh, and, you know, do the press release for the film. Ten months. Hmm. Wow. I believe the press release was about around the time when filming started in January. Hmm. It, it baffles me how quickly a lot of these tokusatsu shows were able to yeah. do a such small time span production. I mean, not even just... Especially uh, for the amount... Uh, Godzilla vs. Megalon few months. Filmed in three weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, yeah. That, that's crazy. Now, I will say, at least with that 
one, um, there were some clear editing issues in yeah. Megalon that yeah. have been since fixed, but still, hmm. um, they really did Inframan quite well with its production time. Anything else? Uh, not, not really. It was just sort of, this was the hope was this was sort of the film to be a breakthrough in the Hong Kong film industry. And while it sort of failed in that regard due to its domestic performance, it's one, uh, it's one of the, one of my now new personal favorite cult classic tokusatsu movies, really. <laughs> Cause after this, there was Mighty Peking Man that Quentin Tarantino uh, actually re-released through yeah. his um, company, which hmm. we'll talk about Mighty Peking Man eventually on here. Hmm. But outside of that, there was the Bruce Ploitation films that were, you know, Bruce Lee movies. Yeah. But there wasn't many other, like, non- kung fu genre films that really made it past hmm. its domestic release from Hong Kong. Hmm. Uh, I do know that so it's, uh, it's when, very interesting. when this film, before it was picked up by Joseph Brenner, it was uh, it was shown in the Cannes Film Festival of 1975 along with about 12 other movies by the short Shaw Brothers Studio. And I'm trying to remember, because it wasn't the Shaw Brothers a part of other tokusatsu? I I, I don't I'm remember not this. Sure, honestly. I'm probably wrong. I'm probably getting them mixed up with the King Brothers. <laughs> Actually, I think I am. They're both brothers, that's all I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Would so, be a problem if there was actually some sort of family connection, <laughs> like a long lost cousin or something. A long lost cousin that brings the two brothers <laughs> together. <laughs> That's funny. Hmm. So I think it's come to that time now where, you know, hmm. we we've briefly talked about this film critically there there mm. wasn't much we really could say that was brand new yeah and we've we've pretty well i think talked about the film in a fair amount of detail from its production to its inspiration to its its impact mm. Mm. let me ask you this what would you rate the super inframan uh, for all of its crazy glory. My personal opinion of this movie, if if I, if you gave me no choice and forced me to use five stars, I would give this probably a four. Really? I, I really enjoyed this in a very similar way that I enjoy Final Wars. I don't love it as much as Final Wars because I have a lot of nostalgia for that film. But this this is a movie I will watch again. I guarantee that. Sure. I for for all the weird weird editing and the bonkers nature of this movie, it I just I just had a great time watching it, honestly. I'm going to sound like the, the hater here. Um, oh, I would give it out of five stars, two and a half. Hmm. I, I, I think it's middle of the road. Hmm. The editing is... It, the, the editing, the plot, it's just all so crazy to me. And then the ending is very abrupt. Hmm. And it's just kind of like, oh, we won, time to go. Hmm. And then they go. And that's it. Um, hmm. I don't hate the film, and I hmm. will watch it again. In fact, this is already my second time watching the movie, and I'm going hmm. to watch it a third, no doubt. <laughs> but so far, I just 
it, I like weird, but I can go so far, hmm. and eventually I just, I, I I'm kind of like blown away by how weird it is that I, I hmm. gotta, I gotta take off. I think any fan of Tokusatsu, especially Henshin Heroes, uh, by Common Rider or Ultraman, watch Super Inframan. It's basically the first. Big but bigger budget that wanted to be its own, and actually got people that worked on the shows yeah. to work. But with my spiel again, this is I think I found the message for this podcast. I read from the Showa era. That's crazy. See, I think your feelings of Inframan is milings of Buckaroo mm-hmm. Banzai. I love it. It doesn't make all the sense it should. But I think it's great. But I, I recommend it. It's available on Image Entertainment on DVD Region 1. Can. So there are and, a of this film. And I do recommend and there's checking also, them out. If for whatever reason you can't get a Blu-ray, then uh, there's, it's also on Amazon Prime Video if you have that. So definitely a few places you can grab it. Hopefully, in the future, we get a company like Arrow. If you can, check it out. Hopefully, a company like Arrow will grab the film and oh, give it, oh, we put it out on Blu-ray first. <laughs> I mean, listen, James Flower, if you're <laughs> listening to us, He's you not, might want to... I mean, he liked one of our tweets once and retweeted <laughs> a podcast episode. Ah. Just saying he might be listening. Ah. So just saying, Mr. Flower, please ask Arrow. <laughs> well, what do we have to do to get Super Inframan in the <laughs> United States on Blu-ray? <laughs> <laughs> but thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you, Rex, for coming on again under short notice after a few cancellations and setbacks. So... <laughs> Where can we find you? What do you do? Give us your links. Um, well, I I have a YouTube channel, Rex Space Cena. Uh, I have a Twitter, Rex underscore Xenomorph, and I have I have an Instagram that is Rex underscore Xeno. And uh, in terms of anything I want to promote, uh, Hopefully, so I submitted like an article to GodzillaMovies.com about about the history of a sort of retrospective look on Godzilla 1984. So, whenever that comes up, I love anyone listening to maybe consider checking it out. Definitely, and don't you edit for a podcast too? Uh, a little podcast. I don't know if you've heard of it, though. Yeah, I probably haven't. It's probably <laughs> stupid anyway. Hmm. I feel so, we've made that back before. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I probably have quite a few times. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Elijah or E.T., however you know me. Uh, I have multiple things, but I'll try and keep this short and to the point. Uh, I am a... YouTuber, you can find me on YouTube at ET13Productions. You can find me on Twitter at ET13Productions, uh, the capitals being ET and P in Productions, all one word. I'm on Instagram, ET13Productions, and I write some articles for GodzillaMovies.com. Hmm. I've done two, three so far, and I'm very proud of my most recent one being a article about camera on physical media here in the United States. Hmm. And I have a book. I recommend it. Thank you. I have a book coming up. Hmm. Uh, I am keeping the title uh, private, but... It should be coming, I'm going to guess, in like a year. It's going to be a side project, but it's going to be a retrospective on the Godzilla franchise. All 66 years, by that point, it'll probably be 67. 
So highly recommend um, staying tuned for that. I'll talk about it here probably time from time to time. And also check out the upcoming K. magazine. What was that? Just in time for GVK. Right. Uh, that <laughs> might be why I do it. We'll find out. And speaking of just in time for GVK, also stay tuned for a upcoming magazine from our friends mm. over at Kaiju Weekly, Kaiju Ramen Magazine, where mm. I have been behind the scenes just kind of helping them out here and there, some suggestions and so forth. Mm. Nothing major. I'm hoping in the future maybe I get to write an article. We'll see what happens, mm. but definitely stay tuned. Check that out. I'll have it linked down in the description below. Mm. That way you can check it out anytime you want to. Mm. Thank you guys so much for listening. And now on with the credits. Mm -hmm. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes. That boosts our ratings and helps us get recommended to more people just like you. If you don't have an Apple device, which I don't blame you, I don't. Tweet us and follow us on Twitter at K-A-I-J-U underscore C-O-N-V-E-R-S. If you don't have either, you can like us on Facebook or Instagram and contact us that way. I don't think you can actually like me, uh, people on Facebook, on Instagram, so just follow us. If you are like me before podcasting and you don't have social media, you can email us at kaijuconversation at gmail.com. It's all lowercase, all one word. You know the drill. And as always, we'll read your reviews on air for anyone to hear. If you rate us five stars, it'll get us recommended as stated, and more people can listen to me and whoever I have on, probably Rex, ramble about something tokusatsu-related for an hour. If you'd like to chat with me or Rex or anybody on the topic of tokusatsu and others to hear your opinions on different subjects, join our Discord server where you can talk to people that relate to you in multiple levels when it comes to tokusatsu. It's a lot of fun. We've got a great community here, and we record. You can potentially be on an episode. Then Rex doesn't have to be here every time I have a last-minute cancellation. <laughs> and if you're listening to us through YouTube, please don't forget, or if you want to, don't, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that bell so you can be notified when we upload. Uh, we have yet to do anything but episodes, but I'm hoping to do short rants or just having fun, maybe a gaming video if I learn how to game, something like that. Thank you, Rex, for editing these poorly planned episodes. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. I don't know how long you're going to be up tonight, but I need this tomorrow, so <laughs> please edit it. <laughs> so... Check out the description for all the links I've described. And everybody, please, 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 remember that life is too short to not talk big. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>